Hello, everyone, and welcome today by top MMA journalist and host of Lynch on Sports, James Lynch. Um, James, great to have you. Great to meet you. You're one of the best in the game, and it's an honor to be able to talk to you today. Well, Patrick, the honor is all mine. Thank you for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So first, I wanted to talk about some other sports and stuff because you have interest in a couple other sports. You're a Canucks fan. You have a Mariner Jays Mariners Jays go rivalry going on with your wife there, and you work for Matthew Berry, and I know you probably have some interest in football as well. So just talk about that. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I think you have to like other sports. I know Joe Rogan, for example, doesn't watch any other sports. I think that's crazy. Um, I grew up a hockey fan. If you live in Canada, I think it's mandatory. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up a, a hockey fan. I actually initially wanted to get into uh, being a hockey reporter. And then I took like a really sharp right turn when I was in university and started covering MMA instead. But maybe it's the physicality or whatever. I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, I love hockey. And I think it's honestly, I think it's important to have other interests outside of MMA because, um, you know, this is a great sport and I certainly love it, but it can be very uh, overwhelming because there's just no off season, right? Like in other sports, you get that summer or winter break or whatever. Um, so I like having, you know, something else to look forward to and, and kind of shut my brain off from MMA, you know, temporarily if I even want to watch my Canucks lose another game, which has been the theme this <laughs> season. Yeah, I'm not the biggest in the hockey, but I heard they haven't been. They haven't been doing no, they've been awful. Um, yeah. And the worst part is like, just to give you an idea, like our ownership refuses to rebuild and we clearly need one like badly. Like this core is clearly not getting it done and they're in salary cap hell. And yeah, I mean, I could go on for hours about that, but like I said, it's good to have other interests outside of MMA. I think just because like I said, it can be very overwhelming, especially now when I first started covering MMA, they used to have, you know, I think a good schedule where you get maybe a week or two off. Now it's like the grind is every weekend, you know, and it's, I love it, but also it would be nice if they kind of, you know, focus a little bit more on quality over quantity, if you know what I mean. No, of course, of course. So I actually wanted to talk a little about, a bit about that transition from hockey into MMA. What made you change into MMA and what sparked that MMA interest in the first place? What was the first thing that got you into mixed martial arts? Season one of The Ultimate Fighter. I don't know why. I just remember flipping through the channels. This was back when it was on Spike TV, the very first season. Um, I'm flipping through the channels and I'm like, what is this show about? And uh, I got hooked. I don't know what it was. I uh, really liked the show. Um, and you got to remember back in the day when The Ultimate Fighter first premiered, there really wasn't any other way to watch sort of prospects, right? Like there was no contender series. There was no like, I mean, there was like regional promotions, but they, you could so small. Them. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, there was no, there was no UFC fight pass back then. So you couldn't watch a lot of it. So really what you were seeing for the most part was the top prospects that were in MMA. So it was kind of like cool to see like, you know, some of these up and comers and that had a great season. If you remember, there was obviously, uh, you know, Forrest Griffin, Stefan Vaughn, rest in peace, uh, Diego Sanchez, Josh Koscheck, Kenny Florian, Chris yeah. Lehman. Like there were so many characters and I think they did such a good job of like, like uh, kind of character building, I guess. And then you had the two coaches with Couture and Liddell. So that's what got me into it. And I kind of felt like as I was starting my media career, that it would be better for me to like go somewhere that was a bit more niche than to go into hockey, which like everyone in Canada, like if you're in sports media, pretty much everyone wants to do that, right? So I figured this would be an easier path for me to sort of break through. And, and it certainly worked out because I've been doing this full time now since 2017. Nice. Yeah, I, um, I kind of thought the same when I was picking like, careers and stuff i've been a huge mma fan since i think want to say 2017 2018 but i was always into football it was always football 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 but the more i got into it i was like i, I don't want to do football it's so big i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go anywhere with that like i love mma I, i'd love to work mma and I, that's how i got into it so yeah you got you kind of got to have that like realistic mindset when it comes to it like you know mma started what this is the 30th anniversary of the ufc yeah so mm -hmm. you know the nfl has been going on for almost a hundred years at this point. So it's, it's a definitely a difference in terms of like being able to get yourself out there and expose yourself. Well, not only that, but, and by the way, I love talking about this stuff. So that's when you hit me up. I was like, yes. Cause I like, you know, I usually I'm the guy asking the questions, but I like talking about the industry because I think it's very unique in that um, not to go on a huge rant here, but like, if you look at like football or other, the major sports, there's a pretty clear path on how to go about getting to where you want to get to, whether it's, you want to be on the television side or the writing side, like there's a pretty clear path there with MMA. It's really the wild West. You'd be surprised how many people in this industry that cover the sport full time, don't have any background in sort of journalism or anything like that. It's sort of, they work their way up. They got experience just sort of learning on the job. Um, and, and even for what I'm doing now, like my job didn't really exist a couple of years ago, right? Like there weren't yeah. people doing video interviews remotely. It was mainly a lot of writing and then they switched 
switch over to video, obviously about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Like I remember when MMA Junkie first started their YouTube channel, it was like a big thing. They were going more to the video side of things. So I think that's one of the interesting things about this, uh, you know, this sport is that like, you really don't need, like people are always like, do you need a university degree? No, I don't think I've ever been asked for my, like I have a, com I have a communications degree, um, a media communications degree, and then I have a, um, a television broadcasting diploma from college as well. But I've never been asked for that. It's more like, what do you, what have you done? And, and it's, it's more about experience in the, in the industry. Yeah, no, that's great. That's what I noticed really with a lot of journalists and stuff is none of you guys went to huge colleges for journalism. None of you mm -hmm. guys were at big universities going for journalism or this. It was kind of a, like almost like a last minute change that it was like, you know what? I kind of go want to go and do this. And you guys have been so successful. Like you, Aaron Bronsted are similar. I know Marcel had a kind of similar path as well. So like, it's just, just funny that it, it kind of works like that. But it is, you it's not there's no set way to break into mma you could just kind of go with the flow and if you're create, creating and producing good content you will succeed absolutely and and i think a key thing as well is to just keep improving and you got to learn how to take criticism like that's one thing that i think some people have a hard time with i see a, you know a lot of up and comers get a bit of an ego and, and and to me just lose that if you lose that and you're willing to accept fair criticism and i'm not talking about the criticism from people on social media a lot of people make that mistake too where they'll post something and say what do you think well who cares what they think they're not the ones who are hiring you or paying your bills or anything like that talk to established people in the industry get concrete tangible feedback and then improve like i I'm always trying to improve. Like, um, you know, I, I still make mistakes, you know, doing this as long as I have, um, you know, and it's, it's little things, whether it's, you know, if you're on the video side, upping your production, trying to, you know, upgrade your camera, upgrade your graphics. Um, if it's content, like one of the things I'm trying right now with my YouTube channel, uh, is just coming up with different concepts and trying to, you know, be innovative because if you do the same thing that everyone else is doing, you get lost in the shuffle. So, um, I, I think that's like a key thing as well as just like, kind of look at what you've been doing, seeing where you want to go with it. Uh, what are, you know, what, what are some, you know, proper feedback that you've got, take that build on that and then, and then move ahead and uh, try not to be stagnant. Um, and then just, you know, like I said, try and evolve, uh, you, you got to evolve in, in any industry, in any area of life. I think you should always be looking to do that. No, definitely. I mean, I saw recently you started on your YouTube the uh you started a couple of new like series and stuff, but like one of the ones I watched was like the what's next, like who's what's yeah. next for each fighter and stuff. Like you're you're just like you said, constantly evolving, constantly trying new things. You can't stay stagnant because you always need to be able to move with the times, seriously, yeah. because the MMA media content that was coming out five years ago is a lot different than what's coming out today. You need to be able to progress. So yeah, I like that mindset with that you have towards it. You really do need to be able to keep moving on and get out of your comfort zone sometimes. A hundred percent. Yeah, you got it. It's the name of the game. Mm -hmm. So you're a big Nirvana fan. What other music and artists do you like? Uh, like, what, what do you listen to, basically? Uh, you know, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm like an old guy that's kind of stuck in the past. Like, I like a lot of stuff that I grew up with. Like, I grew up in the 90s, so a lot of the 90s music. Um, you know, when I go to the gym, it's got to be something like upbeat. I don't like listening to music when I'm, when I'm lifting weights. I don't know why. I just like... I always feel like if something happens, I want to have all my senses around me. Like, oh, I don't mind if music's playing in the gym. That's fine. But if I go for a run, I need music 100%. So like I went for a run this morning. I've got like a mix. Like it's it's all over the place. I wouldn't say I'm like a specific fan of one specific artist, but, um, you know, definitely a lot of 90s, a lot of 80s, uh, all that stuff. Like I, I don't know, a lot of the new music, like it's not my, like some stuff I like, but it's, I'm very choosy on that, you know? Yeah, no, I actually, I grew up listening to the new music only. And, and as I've gotten older, I, I can't listen to a lot of it anymore. A lot of the stuff that I used to listen to, I'll go back and listen to it. And I'm like, God, how did I ever, like, how did I ever listen to this? Music? You change, right? You become a different person. Yeah, yeah, as you get exactly. Older, right? I, uh, what's it? So I've been getting into a lot of like, you know, like Coldplay and like just some older stuff, like Fallout Boy and stuff like that. A little bit of Nirvana. So. That's so funny. Like you saying it's older and it, it is a hundred percent like but Coldplay and all that. But like, that's what I grew up. Like, I mean, I yeah. had that, I listened to that in university, you know, it's crazy. I know, I'm only 19 though. So I'm really like young when it you comes got the whole life ahead of you man yeah, that's exactly. that that's the you're you're uh you're just entering in i wouldn't even say you're prime but like you're entering in like the best time of your life is your, exactly. your early 20s man it's great so yeah so uh how do you manage working for so many different mma media outlets at once i went on your linkedin and i think there was i want to say it was 14 different it's, like, it's up there yeah because i like and that's like, how i'm able to do this is that i have so many sort of um you know uh, so many hands in so many different outlets um and, and that's how i'm able to like sort of make up what would be a full-time salary because there aren't a lot of people like me a lot of people that are doing this full-time or with one outlet they're with mma fighting or mma junkie or one of these things full-time and i did the full-time thing uh, a couple of years ago um you know it, it it was it was cool but i kind of like the fact that like everything's on me you know like at the end of the day like if something 
thing doesn't happen with, you know, if there's something that goes wrong with one outlet, I'm still getting money coming in. I got two kids, I got a mortgage to pay. You know, these are all important things. So um, for me, it's, uh, yeah, it's Google Calendar is a big one. Like I, I have sort of a window of when I like doing my interviews. Every Friday, I don't schedule any interviews unless it's like, an exception, like maybe I have some extra time, but Fridays, usually I focus on my YouTube channel. Cause YouTube's kind of like my part-time, um, sort of gig, I guess. Cause I like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on the, I'm in sort of a unique spot where, you know, I am sort of in the MMA journalism world. I interview a lot of big name fighters, but then I also have this YouTube channel where I'm trying to, you know, make money off that and try and make myself as a brand on YouTube. So I'm kind of in this hybrid world. Cause they're different worlds, like journal, like the, the journalism side of things, you got to be kind of buttoned up and, you know, professional. And I think with YouTube, you can get away with a little bit more. So I try and walk that line a little bit, but it kind of always schedule things as like Monday to Thursday, I do my interviews. Um, and then, you know, I have some other stuff in between there. And then, uh, and then Fridays is like, just focus on the YouTube channel, whether it's editing, whether it's making my own thumbnails for YouTube, whether it's figuring out, like I have a calendar of like what content I want to go on the channel in specific days, days and then yeah. things like that. It's just, I just keep things really organized and it's not as bad as people think. Like if you just take some time to like kind of outline your week, um, then, then it's, it's pretty easy actually. Like no, I know absolutely. exactly what I'm doing hour by hour, basically. A little bit more manageable than I'd realized. Like the, uh, the other week, I think I had had like four interviews in one week and I was sitting there like the week before, like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? It's going to be horrible. I, I managed it pretty well. Cause I had everything planned out. Like, and I knew when I was going to do what, and then I was going to edit this, this time. And I was going to edit this, this time. And it was, it ended up working out pretty well. So I, yeah, no, I'm kind of still trying to figure out and I could definitely use some tips from you and how Anytime, to, man. I'm happy how to, to help. organize yeah. that. Like, you know, that also the, the side of journalism and making your own brand, like all, like all of that, like I'm still getting used to as well, just because I'm just starting out. So definitely would love to get some more tips from you on that. Anytime, man, anytime. Happy to help. Cause again, it, there's no real like resource out there other than if you just talk to people, right? Like there's no, like I said, with other sports, there's a clear path on how to get where you want to get to. Um, whereas in MMA, it's kind of like, yeah, I mean, I've seen people in like a year or two really boost up their profile and, and be full time. But the reality is a lot of people, they're not full time because it's very difficult to make a living in this industry. It's, uh, you know, you have to, you have to maneuver it around a little bit. And again, not like you kind of mentioned off the top, like not all my stuff is MMA. I do some football stuff for Matthew Berry's. And so that's something else where it's just a little bit of extra income that I can use to like do other things. And, 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 you know, people ask me, why don't I just go full time on YouTube? It's because I don't want to rely on YouTube views to pay my bills. I like knowing how much I'm making every month. And then the YouTube money, I use that for, you know, other expenses, like in reinvesting yeah. into my business, uh, travel expenses, things of that. The, nature, extra, right? the extra stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that, that's kind of how I keep things safe and I can still make sure the lights are on in my house, you know, oh, it makes, it makes hundred percent sense. You kind of, you, you, you have your finances managed as well as you have your interviews and everything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's everything's really got to nice. be very organized. Yes. Again, Google yes. calendar. Very useful. Good. Okay. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. So I wanted to know the story about how you're banned from interviewing all fighters managed by Ali Abdelaziz. Yeah. So he's, uh, I mean, it's, it's basically just that he's really petty and, um, he, uh, like, like I've tried to reach out, I've tried to make amends. Um, it's just, he's one of those guys that just doesn't. Um, so, so basically the last straw was I interviewed Abe Kawa, who's a rival manager from first round. He reps, uh, well, they used to rep Mosfidal and John Jones and they rep still like a number of fighters. And I brought up in the interview, how Ali assaulted Abe at a PFL event. And I just said, you know, you guys are both at this event. Is there any sort of restraining order? Like what's the deal? And he's like, yeah, like he can't go near me. And that's all I mentioned in the interview, but that was enough to get me banned. And so, um, yeah, I can't interview his fighters. Uh, he thinks he's, you know, like in his head, I'm sure he thinks that like, oh, he's really hurting me. But the reality is he's hurting his fighters because, um, you know, I don't need the, the Gaethje's and these, you know, these big names. I really don't. Cause I have, you know, I've, I've good relationships with other management, with other fighters, you know, I can still get the big interviews. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the fighters that, that like, you know, fighters always complain about fighter pay. Right. And, and I'm on their side. I think there should be a better, uh, system for fighters to get paid and all that. But, um, you know, the, if, if you want to be more popular, you got to do more media and it's, it's not me that's hurting. It's the, you know, the, the fighters that are on the prelims, the fighters that are in other organizations, they yeah. need the media as much as they can. And I know there's still, some of them are still getting interviews, but are they getting sort of the interviews with someone with a bigger platform? Probably not. They're not going to be on the MMA hour. Every, and that's the other thing. Ariel is also banned, uh, which is hilarious because it's like, really other than true. ESPN, um, what other big outlets are they going to be able to get access to that they, they can't? So like, why is Islam not on Ariel's MMA hour on Monday when he just went on? It's because of a petty thing between the why, manager why is and Volkan Ariel. instead of Islam when Islam. Exactly. Yeah. And it should be both. But and, and Ariel's That's in the same true. boat as me, where it's like, again, something really petty. And and it's it, and his, in his in his mind, he's thinking that he's going to hurt 
um, the journalist by doing that. But the reality is a lot of us are okay without them. There's plenty of fighters to interview. I'd rather focus on that than try and mend this relationship when I've reached out a number of times. How many, uh, approximately how many fighters does he have under his management? Probably about 200 uh, around there. If you think about it, probably if I had to guess, maybe, maybe around that, yeah. I mean, he's got a lot in the UFC, but you got to remember Bellator, no, of course. Uh, PFL, there's, yeah. PFL, there's a ton. Um, and then he's been signing all these like older veterans that aren't in the UFC anymore. Presumably I think at the time was to put them in Eagle FC, but uh, it seems like Eagle FC is not a thing anymore in, in the U S oh, anyway. So, yeah. So, I mean, they haven't, the last event they did was May last year and we haven't heard a thing about yeah, another event. Him, Kevin so. Lee's leaving Diego Sanchez is doing bare knuckle. I mean, it seems yeah, pretty likely to have yeah. any shows on anymore. Right. So oh, you're right. You're right. And they had another, they had another decent name on there. I forget who, but he's gone to, he went to Bellator or something like that. So no, you're right. You're hundred percent. Right. Have you ever had any fighters get mad at you for picking against them? Because oh, I, wa yeah, I, have. I watch your pick videos and you're honest. You don't pull punches. You tell the people what you think is going to happen in that fight. And you really like, it, not that you're rude about it, but you're, you're honest about it. You're not, you're not going to sit there and be like, ah, oh, you know, I like this guy. So I don't want to pick against him. You're like, no, I like him, but I think this other guy has the skills. Like, so just explain that. I think you can be, fair when it comes to assessing a fight i mean i never use words like this fighter sucks or he's no. terrible or anything like that i i'm very conscious of that and again this comes back to kind of my background which is sort of the traditional tv side of things which is just you know you can be honest but you can also be respectful and i try and do my best at that and you know i know no matter what there's going to be fighters that don't like you most fighters are cool about it like i had calvin cater on an interview after he beat uh, uh chikaze mm -hmm. and uh you know he kind of made a joke about it in the interview and that that's how you should treat it to me it's a lack of respect on the fighter's end if you're going to be mad at me or block me or whatever i had a fighter send me a long text message how upset he was that i picked against him he was the underdog in that fight and uh and i said look i said if you want to talk about this on the phone i'm more happy to do that um if you want to kind of see my point of view on this, like, I don't think I was out of line. I think I was very fair and gave my honest assessment. I'm not here to, you know, this isn't, our job is not PR. Our job is to cover the sport objectively. And, and yeah, the fighter didn't take, you know, didn't take any, doesn't like me, unfollow me, all that. I'm, that's fine. Like, listen, the one thing you have to realize in this industry is you have to have a thick skin. There's going to be people, no matter what you do, that aren't going to like you. And yeah. to me, it, the way I look at it is if you really respected me, you would handle things behind closed doors. You'd get my point of view on something rather than just say, oh, I'm going to like disassociate myself. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But like I said, there's so many fighters to interview. I'd rather focus my energy on that. No, a hundred percent. I just kind of, as myself starting out being new, I kind of do worry a little bit when it comes to something like that. As long as you're professional, then then it's on them. And that if it was, if it wasn't that, it would be something else they'd be upset for. That that's what you have to realize. Like you can't okay. take it personally, and you just really have to separate yourself from the fact that, like I said, people, no matter what you do, are not going to like you. It's just the way it is. Okay. So, who impressed you the most at UFC 284, and whose stock would you say went up the most, and whose stock would you say went down the most? Jack Della Maddalena impressed me the most. Um, I think very highly of Randy Brown. I said numerous yeah. times on my preview show that I thought the line was too high. I think that I Jack Brown was going to beat him by decision. Well, I, I felt I still felt Jack like I still felt like Jack was going to win. I just felt like this was kind of reminded me of a case of a fighter who has looked very impressive, but has maybe not fought the best opposition. And I felt like Randy was a bit of a step up. Yeah. Um, so I think he would have a tougher time, but it didn't matter. He went out there and got another first round finish. So I think Jack Della Maddalena for sure his stock went up a lot. Um, and then as far as like a stock down, I, I think it has to be Jimmy Crute. I know he fought to a, to a draw against Alonzo Menafield. I thought Crute was going to go out there and finish Alonzo Menafield. I was again, looking at the level of opposition that he fought and saw that, Hey, Jamal Hill knocked him out. Last time I checked, he's the lightweight champion of the world. a light heavyweight champion. Um, and, and, you know, Anthony Smith, which was more of an injury. So I thought, okay, he's fighting an aging guy in Alonzo Menafield mid thirties. This should be a winnable fight for him. Crute realistically should have lost that fight by first round knockout. I, the referee gave him a lot of grace yeah. in that first round. And I, I felt like that could have easily been a first round finish for Alonzo. He gets the draw. They do the rematch. I might even be picking Alonzo there because I really feel like Crute really just, I, he didn't really impress me. Like he got hit a lot. Um, so yeah, I would say Crute would be the the stock lowest. Uh, Jack Della Maddalena stock highest if we're going okay. by that. Okay. Yeah. I like those picks. Yeah. Jack Della Maddalena was the first clean punch. He landed on Randy Brown's chin and Randy face planted. Like that was, that was insane. When I yeah. wrote, when I wrote the post, I accidentally wrote knockout. Just because in my head, like he basically knocked Randy out. Randy face planted after the first clean punch he landed. I was like, Jesus Christ. That was like, I, he proved, he proved he's serious. He should really get yeah. like that 
that that Luke kind of fight. I saw that you you said that. I agree that Luke fight is the fight to make. I mean, he's well. He's, it just makes uh, sense because I think he needs to fight a ranked opponent. I was kind of looking at who's available. I know Michelle Pereira is without an opponent uh, with Sean Brady right now, but I think that like Jack, I believe, wants to take some time off. Um, I know Luke hasn't fought in a while. I just think like, what are you getting with Luke at this point? Like he was close to getting a title shot. Like people forget he was the backup for the. Oh, yeah. I think it was the was it the Mosadol fight or the the Leon? I can't remember. It was one of the fights he was like weighed in to be the backup and then ever since then he really hasn't um you know he he hasn't really progressed and uh you know he lost a i mean let's call it like it is he got absolutely dominated by jeff neal and to me and i like jeff a lot i I think jeff's a great fighter and 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 Bilal. um but but i think that like what at this point you've got a guy who's in his mid-30s he's not a prospect anymore what do you do with them? To me, you fight the up and comers. And I think even for Jack, it's a good step up where it's not too dangerous of an opponent, but it's a rank. I think Luke is number nine uh, when I was checking on the weekend. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And again, if it's, if it's too much of a step up for Jack, okay, good. He didn't have to fight like someone in the top five. Um, but if he beats him, then that is the right progression sort of moving up and up. So oh, definitely. I like the Michelle Pereira fight too, but Jack's ranked above him now. Jack's at 14 and Pereira's at 15. So, I mean, that's even, that feels even counterintuitive at that point because it's like we're having two prospects. I know Pereira's not young enough to be considered like a prospect, but he is at the welterweight division. And Mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason to have them fight. We need more prospects coming up at welterweight. So, let them go and fight the Sean Brady's, the Vicente Luque's, the Michael Chiesa's, those guys. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So any expectations for UFC 285? I know you'll be there. It's your first event in a while. But is there anyone you're looking to talk to specifically? Anything you're hoping to see? Just Well, yeah, I mean, I, I like so they they a couple of years ago, they used to do this really great thing where they would have a media day and the fighters would sit on chairs and you would sort of line up and, and, and interview the fighter. And it's like a one on one. They don't do that anymore. Now it's more press conference style. So we're all uploading the same content. So my strategy this time around, luckily, I know a few fighters on the card, like kind of like I've interviewed them a handful of times. I can get to them directly. Uh, my plan for 285 is to obviously do the media day. I want to ask some questions, but I'm going to try and get some stuff outside of the media stuff and just try and do something one on one because you know, you got to stand out. And I just think like a lot of people rely on the YouTube algorithm for views and all that stuff. And I just don't want to be doing that. I'd rather, I'd rather spend more time trying to go to a fighter's hotel and interview them there than to just, you know, upload all the interviews for media day. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to upload a few, but I just like, we're all just doing the same thing. I, I, and, and one thing that, that I mean, content. It's, what's that, sorry? You want that niche content. Yeah, yeah. And just yeah. like give people something different. And, and you know, it kind of bothers me too. And it's no one's fault here. But like you can clearly see there's people asking questions at the presser and they've come up with them and they're asking them. But like another outlet can just upload that and take credit for it. You know what I mean? Like there's kind of – there's that side of it too where it's like yeah. I want something that's different to give my audience than just what everyone's seeing. And it's just whoever has the better camera shot, I guess, is who they're going to go with. Right. So I I think for me, it's uh, yeah, I'm going to try and I'm try I I alter my strategy a bit. So I uh, just give you a quick background. The last event I covered was 276 was the Adesanya and Cannoneer card. And um, it was my first event since COVID because with COVID, the restrictions, I live in Canada. It was very difficult to get over to the U S so I didn't really know what to expect. And then when I saw that there was no like regular media day, like there had been in the past, I'm like, man, this is a waste of time. So I kind of thought this time around, if I cover an event, uh, try and be a little unique, you know, and also like, there's going to be other fighters in Vegas. I'll be hitting them up too. like, yeah. just take advantage of my time while I'm there. Like, it's not a vacation for me. It's, it's, it's work and and, yeah. and, and in a good way. Like I want to get a lot of content while I'm there. I'm, you know, taking time away from my kids. I got to make sure I'm, you know, doing the right thing here. So no, a hundred percent, of course. Uh, so speaking of your kids, I just wanted to bring up family a little bit too. Sure, of course. Yeah. How, how is uh family? I just want to make sure everything was all right. I know you have the cat Fuji. So I just want to make sure. There you go. This is, you did your research. Uh, yeah. Fuji's great. Uh, we've had him since we were married in uh, 2015, my wife and I, and uh, my kids are great. My oldest is five years old. Uh, Landon, he is awesome. He's like a clone of me. Like we look very similar. Um, he's in jujitsu right now, but he's getting into hockey as well, which is great. Uh, Cause yeah. obviously that's what I played growing up. And uh, yeah, he's doing, he's doing awesome. And then I have my youngest son, Kieran is uh, like, he just turned one in September. Okay. Um, he's good. It's, you know, obviously kids that are that younger, a little bit more work, but um, he's, he's great too. Uh, him and his brother get along great. And yeah, family's great. I mean, l- listen, I'm very grateful, very blessed uh, to have what I have. It's uh, you know, that, that's one thing that I think makes sort of this job a bit easier is, you know, you might get some bad feedback online or you might get people like, you know, writing nasty stuff, but all of that's irrelevant. The people, the, the most important, important thing is the the people you see every day. And that's my family. And uh, thankfully I have a great support system, great group of people around me. And that's, that's what matters the most is me being a good father and husband and, and all that good stuff. So. 
Good. Yeah, you said your son is a lot like you. I saw he plays retro video games just like you too. Tell me a yeah, little. Yeah, he. That. Yeah, like I. Well, I just I I played like all the you know the old systems growing up, like Sega Genesis and Nintendo N sixty four and all that. And so, um, I just started playing it. My son sort of caught on, and he's all into the Nintendo Switch right now. But they have a lot of like the classic games on there too. So him and I will um you know kind of play together sometimes and you know for as long because they're hard games back in the day like the you know if you look at some of the old mario games or sonic or any of that they're they're, they're tough because i remember i had to play it and, and it was very difficult and so my son will play a bit of it um but he definitely likes the newer games because they're a bit easier okay. to be honest all right all right that makes sense all right i'm not looking to keep you for too much long but just tips for anyone in my position looking to do what you do um, just, you know, I think the most important thing is don't look at this as something that's going to be like a full-time career right away. It takes time. It could take a year. It could take two years. People don't get into this for the money. They get into it for the love of it. I, I want to be very clear about that because people think like I had someone hit me up the other day and they're like, oh, my goal is to go full-time next year. And I said, that's a great goal to have, but just, you have to be realistic here. A lot of the sites that hire, it's mainly for news writing. It's not for video content. Um, a lot of people are doing video content. It's not hard to find someone to hire to do that. Um, what I would say to people starting out is just just, you know, have another job. Um, you know, if you're in school, you know, still have another job and do this, you know, do a smaller commitment, you know, like, like you said, you did four interviews in a week. I think that's reasonable. How I used to do things was I used to have a, you know, corporate job and I would schedule interviews, I think Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'd keep like a three hour window or something open and say, Hey, do these times work? And if they do great, if they don't, well, then we, then I can't do it, you know? So it's as simple as that. So I think just have realistic expectations. Um, always get feedback from people like that you respect. Like if you want to be a good writer, find the best writer in the industry, you know, like a Sean Al Shadi or Chuck Mendenhall or someone like that, uh, reach out to them. A lot of the people in this industry are very uh, easy to get a hold of and, and would gladly give you advice. Um, uh, so yeah, get it, get, get, you know, get people to look over your work, uh, write the notes down, improve, always look ahead. Um, don't just cover the UFC. That's a big one. A lot of people just think, cause obviously UFC is going to get the most views, but everyone's covering the UFC. I always explain it this way. Like, why would someone watch your UFC preview show when, you know, Luke Thomas is previewing a card or something like you're just, you're, that's your competition preview an LFA card, preview an Invicta card. You're not going to get the views, but there aren't that many people doing it. Find your lane. Um, never turn down an interview. That's another thing. I've seen a couple of people up and coming. They're only interviewing UFC fighters. That's the wrong strategy. The reason I've got so many big interviews throughout my career is because a lot of the fighters that I have interviewed over the years were nobodies. Jamal Hill is a perfect example. I interviewed Jamal Hill in the regional scene back in like 2017, 2016, around there. And we always sort of kept doing interviews as his career went on. And now he's the light heavyweight champion of the world. And I could like, I didn't even have to go through his manager to get an interview. It was just, I, I know Jamal well enough that I can just message him directly and get an interview. So always keep that in mind that someone you might be interviewing on the regional scene that people don't know could potentially be like a big name. And, and fighters remember that some of them are very good about it. Like a Curtis Blades, for example, like Again, I can text Curtis whenever I want to get an interview. He'll always make time for me. Why? Because he remembers that I interviewed him when he was an RFA years ago when no one knew who he was. So that's another big one if it was specifically with interviews. And the last thing I'd mention is go cover local events as well because you get a lot of experience sort of learning how um, you know, the, the business works. Um, again, people want to jump right in and start covering a UFC event. Well, I would recommend learning how, you know, our regional show goes. Cause again, there's going to be teammates there that probably are in the UFC. I've, you know, I, I was doing commentary for a local show here in Vancouver and, you know, there's a number of UFC veterans that were there just cornering teammates. So you can get interviews with them, or you can just at least introduce yourself and do that. So I'd say the biggest things, like I said, to sort of recap is um, find your niche, you know, find niche, niche things, uh, reach out to people that are better at you than what you're doing and, and get advice from them and take that feedback and, uh, you know, build off it. Don't have an ego. Don't think you're better than anyone. Like, again, just, just keep improving the skills and, you know, be realistic about what you, what you want to do. Like, again, you're not going to be a full timer right off the bat. Work your way up, build your brand up. This is a word of mouth industry. Jobs don't really get posted. I mean, they do sometimes, but people that like a lot of the jobs that I get are people coming to me because they've seen my work. That's because I built up such a strong brand. It's not because I'm applying to all these places. So just keep that in mind when it comes to getting hired in the industry. Okay. Yeah, that's about it. I have. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the advice, especially. I will definitely be texting you soon in the future and asking for more tips. No uh, I'm happy to help. Of course. I appreciate everything. And thank you.